All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 39 of Collectible Live. Today is Sunday, July the 9th, 2000, July the 10th, 2022. And my name is Jeremy Lee. I do want to thank everybody who joined us last week with our guest, Reza Arian. That episode has uh, quickly become the most watched episode of Collectible Live. So I'm glad you all enjoyed that episode. I certainly did myself. We are now going to bring out this week's guest. He is a professional sports card dealer, Mark Demers. Welcome to Collectible Live. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Before we jump in, you were just telling me uh, that uh, you, you went on a bit of a trip today. What did you do today? What did you get up to today? Well, I knew I was going to be on the show, Jeremy, and I had a deal put together I didn't know what I was buying, but I know he's a fellow dealer in Connecticut. He had a bunch of cards for sale, and I wanted to make sure I made it here on time. So I left my house at 7 a.m., drove two hours one way, spent about three hours kind of going back and forth, and I came back with about 22 cards back in time to be on the show. Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for committing to this time slot, and uh, it's good to have you, and I hope that deal uh, works out well for you and for the person that you dealt with, right? These things are always best when everybody wins. So uh, with this being, you know, we're really close to the national. There's no new IPOs on the collectible platform this week ahead, so we don't have any IPOs to talk about, which opens up uh, the hour for us to just have a nice uh conversation here with Mark Demers. You are also known as Boston Authentic on Instagram. Everybody, you can see that at the bottom. Feel free to go follow him on IG if you are not yet following him. And if you are not yet following him, what are you really doing? I, I jest, I jest. But go ahead and make sure you are following him. And as always, guys, your comments, your questions are in play. Put them in the chat. Say hello. Ask a question. Make a comment. Uh, love hearing from you all. Mark, Let's jump in, though. Um, and, you know, I want to start with just getting an understanding with how you got started in this hobby. Just like most people, I went through my wave, started as a youngin, kind of hit it in the middle and then picked it up as an adult. When I was younger, uh, just used to open up random packs, nothing expensive, whatever you could get at the local Walgreens or Woolworths or Woolworths. That's a throwback. Uh, whatever, whatever you could get at the local store and just kind of open it and just ooh and ah over what you get. Um, my big thing was I was, I used to try to get autographs, um, not pack pulled autographs. Cause again, I didn't know what I was doing, but back then before the internet, uh, I'm dating myself <laughs> at our local library, they had encyclopedias of, of sorts. And it said, uh, the, the addresses of all the major, all the, all the major sports teams, NHL, uh, MLB, you know, NBA. So I would take whatever cards I had that I enjoyed put them in an envelope, you know, stamp and all, find out and just ask for it, uh, ask for autographs. And I struck out on everything but hockey. I, and there was John Starks was the one that really made me mad because I love that John Starks card. It was like a special hoops card with like a, it had like a, it looked like a basketball. But um, I ended up getting one back out of all the ones I sent. And it was a, a player by the name of Stu Grimson. Basically, he was a mercenary for hire in the NHL. He just went around kicking people's butts. Um, I liked them a lot because of what I saw back in the day. And I went, and that was when we had the Hartford Whalers in Connecticut, because I'm originally from Connecticut. And they played the Mighty Ducks, and he was a healthy scratch. And I was, I was heartbroken. But what are you going to do? Um, but I did end up getting an autograph back. Nothing, not, not like a letter or anything. Just you know, just whatever from Anaheim and the autograph. I don't know where it went, but I thought it was really fun. Um, I think I kind of got out of for whatever reason. Maybe you know, life happens. And then 1999 and 2000 came around, and I actually got heavily involved in Pokemon, not from a standpoint of grading or anything like that, but I actually enjoyed playing the game. I was in tournaments. I was, I was actually pretty good. Um, and uh, as it would have it, my sister actually found my childhood collection at our parents' um, home, and I actually drove three hours back and forth just to get the collection because it just brought back so many memories. So. I have that back into my uh, possession, which I'm kind of happy about. I don't do anything with Pokemon, but um, fast forward about 10 years, because again, adult life happens, my, uh, you know, and um, every show on TV was a, a flip this or a buy that or flip this house or flip this ride or, you know, whatever it was. And there was this one show and a lot of people don't even know this show, but it was called All Star Dealers. Um, it was, it, it featured, uh, gray flannel, the auction house. I imagine this is some, something on the lines of what Ken's going to be doing for his business currently, 
but basically it just followed, you know, the day in the life of gray flannel. And uh, when they'd get stuff in, like James Worthy was on one episode and he got all the final shoes from everybody. That was a consignment or like a Babe Ruth bat. Or, so I saw it. I'm like, I can do that. That's easy. I just go on eBay and buy it. I had no clue about how fraud, fraud stuff works, fake stuff works, all that. I just jumped right in and just started spending money. Um, I ended up getting my first purchase was a, uh, a Lawrence Taylor jersey that I was told game used and a Phil Sims jersey. The Phil Sims jersey ended up being used. I sold that gray flannel, and uh, the, the the Taylor jersey got denied. So, kind of a, a life lesson I learned right there. Um, always been in the game use. I love game use. A lot of people don't know that because a lot of people don't understand the game use. But uh, I did game use from 2010 to current. I tried making it like quote unquote the side hustle, uh, but it's hard because of lack of supply and lack of really buyers. I mean, people think it's cool, but a lot of people are scared to dip their toe in the water. So, um, 2018, 2019 happened. Cards were booming. I was, the crazy thing is I was seeing what the LeBron RPAs were doing. And I'm like, I could have had a rookie Jersey golden sold I think like four years ago for 300,000. It was his fifth career game versus Miami for 300,000. And people are paying millions for this RPA read it on the back, doesn't even, it says like event worn. I'm like, what is this? But uh, I dug deep into cards, you know, uh, learned, 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 made a ton of mistakes. And here I am. All right. No, that's a, thank you for the background. And uh, you were very succinct. I, I appreciate that uh, greatly. Let's uh, let's go into the chat and uh, say hello to, we got Mikey here from MCAM. Good to see you, Mikey. Uh, Leo, hello to you. Do you know what that means? Piong, is that something to you? That, that's my son. That's what they call me. <laughs> got it. Okay. Okay. Jake Dahl, what's going on? Good to see you. How, you got a, Your son's got a lot of friends. Alex Kadena, welcome to the show. Seacron says, never could send my cards out to get lost. Always sent three by fives and had decent success. Do you have any feedback on that comment from your experience? I guess he wouldn't send the cards out. He sent uh, bigger, bigger oh, items out to get autographed when he did. Uh, autograph. I, was, I didn't know values. I just know, knew the pictures. I, we're talking, I was probably 10 years old, 11 years old. Right. So, so I, I, I losing the card didn't bother me. I didn't have like a card like I cried over or anything like that. It was worth a chance. It was worth a chance. Let's say hello to All Valley Collectibles. What's going on? Jeff McMahon. Chris Wong uh, calls you his hero. That's very nice. And uh, we have we have Gabby Kadena in the house as well. Uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. And thank you for joining. So Here's what I find really interesting, and I, I don't think you're alone in doing this over the last few years, but hey, we have you here. Let's talk about it. You quit a well-paying banking job to go into sports cards full-time. Mm -hmm. um, talk, talk to us about how you made that decision. Were you nervous? Any What, what were the risks? Why did you do this and go? <laughs> That's a real loaded question. Well, my career spanned about 20 years, so... I, this is all I knew was banking. Right when I got out of high school at 18, I started working at the bank, just moving my way up. And But again, no one talked about side hustles, but I was selling, buying and selling game used on the side. Um, when I got home, that's all I did, but it just wasn't making enough. Like when I started looking into cards, this is about when the Jeff Wilson era came out, when he first came out and he was talking about, you know, this is this is not only a, a hobby but an investment like i'm like okay let me really listen to what this guy has to say and you know i started making some purchases on stuff i liked and just blew up in my face i'm like maybe this just isn't for me maybe i should stick to jerseys and then um started talking about luca and 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 Giannis and like stick to the stars i got some great advice from a gentleman uh, unfortunately he passed away and when i was in the game used he used i used to buy on value like i'd buy the second wide receiver not the best one or the third wide receiver he's like you will lose all your bankroll if you keep buying you'll have a ton of jerseys with no value so he's like just buy the best of the best if you can only afford one just buy one so i kind of took that approach everything i learned in the game used i applied it to cards and um one of my biggest first deals i did was i bought a Giannis psa 10 prism prism also as a prism silver and an orange bgs 10 um, uh, Giannis out of 60. And when I got those, I held them for about a month. Cause that was at the time when you can buy something. And if you held it for a month or two, it might go up a couple bucks. 
Well, it turned out that I made my salary off that one deal. So it's like, it really started getting my wheels spinning because I've been talking for years. Like I want out, I want out. And my wife's just like, do it, do it. And I'm like, well, what about the insurance? Because in America, we got to worry about, you know, the, the healthcare insurance. You have to have it. And in Massachusetts, you have to have insurance. So that was always stressful and all that stuff. And I, and then finally I took the leap and plunged and said, forget it. I'm doing it. And my wife was a full supporter on board with it. That's wonderful that, that your wife was 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 on board. I mean, without that, <laughs> you might not have been able to make the move, right? You mentioned that you got some great advice from somebody who passed away. Um, was that Terry by chance? No, he actually was a local uh, Massachusetts guy. And this is not living in Connecticut, but I think his name was actually Jeff. Okay. Yeah. He was owned a he owned a big um, uh, a, a lot of properties and things like that. But I used to buy game used jerseys from him, uh, mainly football and. Uh, I, I remember buying a Mal. I, I don't even remember who it was. It was a wide receiver for the Chargers, like the third string. He's like, "Listen, I don't mind selling these to you, but I'm just telling you right now, they're going to zero. Yeah, and that's a good, honest. It's a good. I say it's an, a good, honest vendor or a good, honest uh, transaction partner. And we say honest, but you know, it's speculative. But at least they're sharing their honest opinion with you, and you know that when someone's got something to sell you, and they tell you it's going to go to zero, that that's their honest opinion, right? So. I want to ask you this, as far as um, taking, you know, leaving banking, going into sports cards full time, what have been some of the biggest rewards that you have have received thus far? And I'm not talking monetary, more about just the lifestyle. I can honestly say I have because of the way I save, the way that I, I work my life, I have zero stress. Like I wake up in the morning, sometimes I don't even know what day it is. And it's it sounds strange and weird. But I don't even know what day it is half the time. Uh, this morning, I woke up to my alarm for the first time in about a year. It is the most cringeworthy noise when that Apple iPhone goes off at 6 a.m. to wake you up. I don't miss that at all. And, and you know, just my, my wife works and my daughter works and we have two little dogs, too. So it's always nice to be able to spend time with them whenever I can fit in there. But just being my own boss, like I, I don't have to worry about, you know, politics in the office. I don't have to worry about possibly losing my job. Um, you, know, you just you make your own luck. I mean, it is what you put into it. If you want to sit on the couch all day and not talk to people on Instagram or Facebook or on the phone, you're going to you're going to you're going to drown. Yeah. But so it's a, stories. So you're, you're it's sort of an eat what you kill kind of career for you right now. I guess <laughs> that's a, I know it's a drastic way of putting it. Sports cards, shorts wants to know, how are you getting insurance right now? So in Massachusetts, like I mentioned, <clears throat> we have to have health insurance. Like it's the law. I, and uh, we have this thing called the, uh, the health connector. So basically I just get it through there, but there okay. was one, which I'll tell you guys, if, if, if you're not married, but you have a significant other, a lot of places like a target or a Walmart, you can become domestic partners in the state of Massachusetts and then you can hop on their insurance as if okay. you were guys. Cool. Tell us about the first time you set up as a vendor at a card show. That would be Dallas, March of either 2020 or 21. Um, it's it's kind of like when I first decided, because I quit my job. I actually, yeah, I quit my job January 14th, 2021. So I was two months into this adventure. Is it going to work? Is it not? Whatever. Went to Dallas. Um, my buddy Ryan went there, uh, War Chief Cards, and we set up together. Like, let's just see how it is. It was my first, like, real show. Like, when I was a kid, I did little shows. But this is my first real show, and I didn't know what to expect. I had everything priced. I was trying to be professional. And just as you learn the landscape, it's like, it's just a very chill, like, like just do your thing. Um, but what, probably the best part of it is, I don't know if you've ever been to Dallas, but it's Big Rose. And we were, I was set up with me and myself and my friend, Ryan, but also I met the whole row and we all became, we all became friends. Like we still talk to this day. We go to shows together. We're setting up a national together. Like, it's like, like, it's like a really cool, like serendipitous moment where it all just kind of fit together. And it's also like, you got yourself a support team. I don't claim to know everything about cards or investments or anything. I always, I call it, me and Chris will call it punching a hole in it. I'll say, Hey, I want to do this, punch a hole in it and, and, and tell me why I shouldn't do it. And if you can't punch a hole in the idea, it's a good idea. So it, it's just really cool to have a group of friends that kind of all started at the same time and we're still together. Yeah. That's, that's certain. It's a support system, right? It's certainly yeah. uh, 
valuable. And not only that, but you're passionate about it. You, I can tell from talking to you, love like, and let me confirm though, before I make this assumption, I believe like, do you love cards? I, I love the process. It's not that I don't like cards. It's that I just love the process that goes into it, hunting the cards, researching the cards, selling the cards, being at shows. I actually really enjoy shows. So I enjoy cards. I have yet to get a card that I'm like, I'm never selling you. You're my baby. Like I have not had that, that moment yet. I've had a lot of cool cards, but I've never had that card. Like you're coming to the grave with me. I haven't found it yet. I've got like 2000 of those. So (laughs) (laughs) on the bottom and a whole layer of slabs on the top. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Right. I, I love stories like that, where the hobby, you know, is more than just the cards for, for, or the, the, any, anything really, it's more than just the, the items that we are buying, the products or, that we're buying and selling and collecting it's for you. It seems to be a lot about the community, obviously the process, that's, it's a lot of fun making deals and trades and then seeing how they work out at the end of the day. Right. Um, your friend, Chris seems to be in the chat right now. He says, we are all about the research. So that's a part of the process, right? Yeah. Always about the research. Definitely. Definitely. Here, sports card shorts. This is a good question. As you talk about creating your own success, do you set sales targets for yourself? It's actually, I'm actually glad this question got asked because this was one of my first pitfalls. I almost, because of my many jobs I've had on top of banking, I also worked in car sales, used car sales, but that wasn't my full-time job. It was kind of like a side gig. And, um, I started treating this at the beginning like it was uh, a used car you know, dealership. Like I got to sell, I have to have this quota and this quota and this quota. Once you get to like to the 14th or the 15th of the month and you're not making anything, like you start to really stress out. And that feeling came back from my working days. And I'm like, no, no, this can't happen. This, this, like, I, this has to go away. So at first I had targets. Um, obviously the ultimate target is just make sure you can pay your monthly bills. That's obviously the first target. But again, I have such a great family behind me that if something was to happen or I fall short, they always have my back, just like I have their back, obviously. But um, yeah, I don't think the sales targets are great, especially in this environment. It's not even cards. It's just the whole world's environment because um, it's it, it, it's just, it's, un, it's, it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. Yeah. No. Okay. Good, good, good advice for anybody else who's out there listening. Perhaps sports cards, shorts asks for that reason. So. Uh, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts on that. In 2019, 2020, that's when you kind of shifted from game used memorabilia over to cards. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that earlier. You said that you kind of, you noticed what was going on with the LeBron RPAs. I think that's really interesting. And, but I want to, I want to know, because now you're somebody who's dealt in both mem and cards. And I'm, and I mean, there's other, there's people in the audience that have too. look, look who, uh, Lou, Lou Papa just joined us. Uh, he, he's somebody who I think dabbles in both cards and sports as well, and, and memorabilia. He says right here, Mark is one of the absolute best in the business. That's very nice, Lou. And thanks for joining. Good, good to see you. Yeah, thumbs up from, uh, from Mark. You're right there. Talk to us a little bit, Mark, about what you like better about sports cards, what you like better about memorabilia, uh, what do you like less about one or the other, all these kind of things. Like, because on collectible, they offer IPOs on sports cards. They offer IPOs on memorabilia. They don't favor one over the other. It's it's they they handle both. I want to hear your opinions on what's better about cards, what's worse, what's better about mem, what's worse. Before I get into it, fun fact on collectible: there is a Charles Barkley jersey that was worn in his um, highest scoring game against the Golden State Warriors in Game One. That used to be my jersey. Then it got further matched to two other playoff games which uh, didn't reflect in my price that I sold it for. So still cry a little bit, but that's kind of like my segue into game use is you own the history. Basically, every jersey is a one of one, even if the player wears them in two games. Like, for instance, when Miami, uh, when the Miami Heat played the San Antonio Spurs in the finals, there was that one game where the air conditioners were broke, supposedly. Well, <clears throat> I know the guys who have both of those jerseys because LeBron came out at a press conference and said, I had to change my jersey at halftime. It was just drenched. But just imagine he's sitting on that podium and you have that jersey. Um, <clears throat> football, it was honestly my favorite because you get it and worn like right off the guy's back. And I'm telling you, these jerseys smell, they stink. 
you got to hang them outside for a week because they smell so bad. So that would be the negative on it. Like the positive is, is you have all the markings, you have the wear, nobody else has it, not even the player has it. But now you have to deal with this dirty laundry. You have to, you have to stuff into a bag and you put in your closet. Um, that's what cards come in. Cards are mainly the same size, but unless you're dealing with a Nike promo card and they all fit snug in a box and you can bring them out, you can lay them out. It's so much easier to take pictures of them. So easy to travel with them. Um, there's really no explanation for them. Like whenever you have a game use memorabilia piece, like a jersey, like I'll say a jersey, for instance, you have to explain it was worn in this game. He had this, he had this, he had this. Oh, there's no way you have that. Why would the player give that up? I don't know. But then you watch YouTube highlights and you see it. So I don't favor either of them because they both got their, they, their, their pros and cons, but Jerseys I love because I've done it for so long and just to have the history, but the storing is a pain. Um, getting insurance, it's kind of tough to like collectibles insurance because you have to make them understand this is a true one of one. Uh, <clears throat> and again, with cards, you can accumulate so many and just put them in a nice, you know, Zion case or a box and you can travel show to show and they'll fit in the airport and you go to, you, you know, they, they have their ups and their downs. Yeah, I want I want to touch on one thing you said there, which was you know um, the that you own that Barkley jersey that's on collectible right now, and mm -hmm. after you sold it, it was photo matched to additional games. And by doing collectible live now for almost a year, I'm learning more and more about the game use memorabilia industry, and it seems to me like in recent years this this higher level of photo matching seems to have really come around and it seems to be more highly pursued we have a, a couple of <clears throat> companies that specialize in photo matching alone and you know is it how it seems like a silly question but i'll just let you speak to it anyway like how important is photo matching to the let me phrase it this way how much more how much more stable is the game used memorabilia industry now now that we have these additional photo matching services available to the way it was say five or 10 years ago or, or more. So what's funny, there's, that's like a two prong question. And I'm going to, first I'm going to address game use in general. There's, there's levels of game use. It starts out at the bottom where it's autograph memorabilia, just a pro cut Jersey that's signed. It is what it is. Then there's an issue Jersey, something like, like this, like this Russell Wilson, this isn't game use, but it's made to his specifics, his specifications but it's issued. So basically it sits in his locker in case his other jersey messes up and he needs a replacement or he wants to change it out at the half. Then there's game use that's filthy and, and whatnot. And it's nice in football because you see the dirt, you see the stains, you see the blood, you see the paint from um, whatever they played. And as long as they don't wash it, um, it's real easy to match to Getty images. NBA is a little tougher because you have to count pinholes between the letters of their names like if, like for instance jordan you have to look at all the pinholes the meshels through bulls and there's no way to lay it down twice because basically my understanding is the bulls they get a blank white jersey they have to apply the letters bulls and jordan on the back and the two three you can never lay it down twice the same exact way so basically all those meshels are fingerprints um but photo matching has been around for a very long time like I don't want to toot my own horn, but I I was part of a group that was helping my grade get it started. Like they weren't even doing it. And basically they would call me and, you know, a, a, an old friend of mine and, you know, they're like, does this match? Is this real? Is this, it? because there was a lot of scandals back in the day with pro cut jerseys being rolled around in the backyard and sold to card companies as real. Um, it's, it's public knowledge. You can see it. So basically we kind of came up with that idea and it just took off and rolling. And then, um, Resolution photo matching came around and then um, sports cards. No, I always, it's sports investors, I think, with David Randolph. He came around and um, there's a new company. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's SAAS. Yeah. But basically, basically, it's like a match is a match is a match is what I always say. You go on Getty and you can get those pinholes to match. Then it doesn't matter the letter from where it is because you got it. But what I will say is overseas people, <clears throat> if it doesn't have migrate paperwork, they don't want it. Like my gray is like the gold standard. Like that's what they want. And then as far as it's not like cards where it goes up, down and all around because I would have stayed in it full time. I mean, uh, Jordan jerseys about four years ago, game used jerseys, they were coming up once an auction at Golden 
And they would, you know, they tick up just a little bit per jersey. They started out at like 50 and then 55, then 60. I bought one for like 75. Then they started getting to around 100. And then they kind of stopped. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I mean, you know, quick story, uh, Jordan Gilroy, one of your, uh, from Leland's, he had a Jordan jersey at National last year. He's like, hey, Mark, do you, you know, would you be interested in buying it? I said, how much? It's about three times what the last one, so what they were selling for. I said, you got to be out of your mind. Well, now they're running on auction, going for four, five, six, seven hundred thousand. I'm like, man, I should have just stayed, like, or just kept what I had because this. I've had, I've had many Jordans, Bulls jerseys, a couple Wizards jerseys. I've had a very early Elway jersey. Like, I've had some really epic stuff, but it's like it's just like in the card mindset. You can't hold everything. You can't keep everything, and stay in business. Yeah, no, fair. Appreciate it. Good, good, uh, good response to my question there. Thank you very much. Let's say hello to I Collect Etro. What's going on? Good to see you. And uh, Lou says, Mark, we got, we need to get Jeremy to buy a nice Gretzky jersey to complement his card collection. Like, I don't even know what a Gretzky jersey would go for in like a gamer. I don't want, I, if I'm getting any piece of memorabilia, it needs to be game worn. Otherwise, to me, what? what's the point right and i feel that way about cards for that for that matter as well but uh you know as far as the the swatches within but um yeah what, what would a gretzky jersey be worth nowadays a gamer well here's the thing an oilers jersey is absolute hockey gold there's yeah. a, i don't even know if you know this story or you can look it up after there was a guy I, I don't know where he was from but his house caught on fire he's one of the biggest gretzky collectors this dude ran inside while his house was on fire and grabbed all his gretzky stuff because he has a lot of oiler stuff. Oiler stuff is so rare. I think SCP ran this rookie jersey like three, four years ago. I'm talking this thing looked like it was worn for six seasons. It was as thin as toilet paper. And it sold for 400 grand, which was like a record. This is like four years ago. Now that, that last Oilers jersey that he wore that sold a gray flannel did 1.4 million. I still think that's cheap, but I'm not going to be shelling out 1.4. But you're better off with Gretzky going after a Kings jersey if you just want something he wore. But yeah, if it- I, let's face it, I'm not going to end up with any of these. But uh, but if I did, I would. I'd probably take a Kings. But I mean, I agree. Oilers is gold, and that's what I would want as well. That's where he did most of his damage. One is Stanley Cups, right? You mentioned the collector who ran into his house that was on fire. His name is Sean Chalk, and I yeah. had him. I had him on Sports Cards Live. Well, gosh, it feels like a couple of years ago already. It was maybe a year and a half ago. It was episode. I had him on episode number ninety nine, which was obviously Gretzky's number, and uh, and we had a great show. And he told that story. He told the story about running into his house, into his house that was on fire to to pull out what he could that was very important to him. So yeah. I forget the details, but um, that was definitely uh, an interesting story. I'm glad that you you raised it right here. Uh, Patches fifty five says, uh, "What do you think about?" the or jersey and kobe jersey on the collectible secondary market do you are you familiar with these pieces i'm not familiar with the pieces i mean i don't know if you're asking price wise and whatnot i i've seen a boston bruins i I believe or jersey that that been saying was photo match that sold a few times but i'm not i'm not i haven't looked and looked at it yeah that one was owned by Justin Cornett, who was on an early episode of this show, Collectible Live. I also want to shout out Lou Papa, who is, I believe, our guest on episode number one of Collectible Live. He helped kick off this series, who's also in there. But um, I believe the ore belonged to Justin Cornett, uh, but I don't know anything about the Kobe. I don't, but Kobe jerseys right now, you can find them in auction. Uh, they're, as long as there's nothing special tied to it. They're about a hundred thousand dollars right now, as long as they're photo match, of course. Um, but they're about a hundred, and that's a. I remember in 2016 when Panini, uh, what had all the jerseys, were getting all the jerseys from his final year, and I was getting offered offered uh, 12k a piece, and I'm like, Kobe jerseys aren't going anywhere. Well, yeah. they fast forward to his passing, and it's like everyone. There was a pair of Kobe shoes that sold last night at iconic auctions that he wore versus T Mac for fifty thousand dollars, and the auto was said in the description, I'm not, you know, making anything up, but that they believed it was uh, like a clubhouse auto. It wasn't Kobe who signed them, but the shoes were photo matched and they went for $50,000. That's still pretty cool. I mean, yeah. game used Kobe shoes. Uh, I'm a, 
I'm a fan of that. I have one pair of sneakers in my sneaker collection, and they are they are Kobe. They're all yellow. I just happened to buy them at <laughs> in California a couple of years ago. Anyway, um, let's go to some other comments here that we have. Uh, Tampa Home Investor says, "How can card companies afford to purchase game used if the prices are that high?" And as far as you know, as far as young players go, I think it's easy. They have deals with the teams and the leagues. But as far as retired players, you know, there's a big there's there's a there. For example, Wayne Gretzky in hockey, his game used memorabilia, especially Oilers pieces, are through the roof because people don't believe that Upper Deck will ever be able to buy or ever just buy another Gretzky jersey. Uh, so to me, they're not going to it. They they're not. They can't afford it. What do you think? Well, on, on the on the Gretzky topic, it's not religious. If you cut up an Oilers jersey, you should go to jail for ninety nine years. Like it's over. <laughs> but um, it's that. that it's an, it's an, you're peeling me back like an onion right now. That was another little side hustle I had. I used to get a list, uh, 2012 it started. I used to get a list from somebody, which he got from Panini, and like, find me these jerseys. They were all football, though. Like, Nick, Fol Nick Foles was on the Eagles that year. That was big. Like, uh, Larry Fitzgerald. Like, just find me these jerseys. I'd get a little percentage, send the jersey in, and then they'd cut it up for their, for their cards and things like that. Because, again, there was a – it was found out that a lot of these jerseys were issued that they were using in there. And instead of using like what they do now with at least they tell you on the bottom, this is not associated with a player or whatever. They just, it's game used. But now like Patrick Mahomes, for instance, he has a contract, I believe with Panini where they get one Jersey a year. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they have their own, they have their own little um, deals. But what I will tell you is on your last show, you had a, um, a viewer reach in and say, Hey, what's going to happen with the new regime with fanatics? Well, a lot of people don't know, but Fanatics has a game use division. They have uh, team deals with the Jaguars. This is all uh, public knowledge, too. Uh, the Jaguars, the Browns, the Chargers, um, and then whoever they can get. So basically, Fanatics, they might bring back the, the true used RPA, uh, obviously the Sixers. Um, they were one of the first people uh, to have Giannis game use jerseys. And it was actually funny because they, Fanatics offered me two rookie jerseys. And I said, why would I want to play a jersey of a player? I can't even pronounce his name. Fast forward, <laughs> I bought those jerseys. But uh, Fanatics, I think, when, when it comes to the patch auto stuff, they're going to bring a lot, of, a lot of what the collectors want to the market because they have access to it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I like this comment from Tampa. He says, there should be a price per inch for the jerseys to help comp our cards. <laughs> Right, that would be that would be pretty funny and, and interesting. And Jake Dahl wants to know what would a Maurice Richard gamer go for? And I don't know if you're familiar with the Rocket, Maurice Richard. No, the the football player. No, no, oh. the hockey player. Yeah, a lot, Jake. A lot. He goes back to the days of Gordy Howe. Uh, he's one of the one of the all time greats in in hockey. Well, yeah, the thing, Joe Pro, ninety nine years. LOL. I agree with you. Go ahead, the Mark. Thing is, is back in the day, and this is for all sports. These sports teams were not profitable. They were losing money. So you were lucky to get a home and an away jersey. You didn't have like Nacho Night and and like these special nights and stuff. You had a home and an away, and you just had to use it. I had a Mike Singletary jersey from the Bears that he wore for two straight seasons, and they had this thing so rigged up with fishing line on the shoulders because he used to wear those big pads back in the day. These things like. Uh, it, it would there was more fishing line or whatever this thread was than there was jersey because they had to do it back then. I remember there being um uh I forget the player, but from the Seattle Supersonics, he had a jersey where it was two totally different numbers, like fonts of numbers, like a two and a four, and the four was way bigger than the two. It didn't belong, but it's like they had to cut where they could, and that's what the seamstress did. But back in the that's why I say this stuff is so rare. Like uh even Gretzky, as much notoriety as he got. And how great he was, like game used. What no one was thinking about it was just dirty laundry. Some stuff was left behind. That jersey that just sold for one point four million was just left behind. He went to the Kings. It was left in his locker, and someone grabbed it. So simple as that, eh? Crazy. It's crazy when you think back to all the things we could have had, or we we should even just wrappers of ba you know baseball cards in the sixties, seventies, eighties, just. Who thought about keeping those? I how, the, the the hundreds of wrappers I crumpled up and threw in the garbage. It's uh, it's staggering. It's it's just staggering, actually. Um, okay, let's move along. I want to know, uh, you know, 
when you are in a profession, and I do consider you to be a professional sports car dealer, oftentimes it makes sense or people just naturally work their way into a specific area that they specialize in. Do you consider yourself to specialize in any certain area within sports cards right now? If I had to give you a nutshell answer, it would probably be LeBron. Uh, just because when I came into the hobby, he felt like the most stable player, plus everything he was doing. And I, I had a lot of his jerseys. So it was just kind of all kind of morphed together. Um, I obviously just lit in my card career. I lived through a championship and saw his highs. And I lived through a uh, not even getting to the play-in tournament low, which we're all going through right now. And um, it's just like, wow. Like, I remember when SP500s were this and now they're that. So it's like I specialize in LeBron, but I realize that if you just kind of specialize in one guy, the other stuff kind of gets away from you. Like, the other players get away from you or other opportunities get away from you. All On top of that, if, God forbid, that player says something, does something, or, you know, whatever – your whole collection takes a beating. So it, it's almost like card diversification. I mean, I come from, again, a, a, a money background, a, a, a monies and figure background, and there's gotta be diversification. And uh, I learned that, unfortunately, the hard way. I have a lot of LeBrons that are worth 50% of what I paid, but you gotta lick your wounds and move forward. Yeah, you know, when it comes to LeBron, I feel like, you know, he should be a blue chip investment in our hobby because, He's done what needs to be done to become an all-timer, an all-time great, maybe top three of all time, uh, all, all these things. And he's even he even transcends just being an all-time great or Hall of Famer. He's somebody that is, uh, you know, he transcends the sport, but that might be to the detriment of the value of his cards because of, you know, political stances and, and that sort of thing. How risky in your mind is that to a player like LeBron? Getting political and doing extracurricular stuff outside. Having, I guess having things that occur outside of the court yeah. and outside of the, the realm of the sport of basketball or whatever sport we're talking about for the first specific athlete, uh, that type of thing. I, I think with greatness, uh, people forgive and so or forget or you win them a championship. Uh, it's called uh, hype, basically. Like, what have you done for me lately? When when uh, they were when they were bubble champions, whatever you know, call them what you want, but at least they played basketball for us. Anthony Davis and LeBron James cards were through the roof at that time because they were just dominating. But as soon as it's as soon as they're not doing what you want for you, and then doing extracurricular stuff on top of that, it's like, well, well, LeBron cards are this. I'm moving on to Luca or Trey or whatever. So it's a very what have you done for me lately? And I, I believe that for all athletes, even outside of cards, like. They love fans, but it's like, again, what have you done for me lately? And it's always, oh, I paid this much for the tickets or I've been a fan forever. It's like, I'm doing the best I can with what I got. I mean, but go back to Jordan. He even said it in the in his documentary. Listen, his what his mom wanted him to back uh, someone that was running for mayor or for governor. And he says, I don't get political. Republicans, and Democrats, they both buy shoes. You yeah. got the guy a check and nothing ever happened to Jordan's uh, legacy. So. It, it might be one of those things like it's great. Use your platform, but just know that you could be standing on the hill too. I think that even, even these comments that might be made on social media by very public athletes like a LeBron, you know, I wonder what impact it's going to have way down the road. And by, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, I'm just going to bring up a couple comments quickly. And I have one more comment of my own. Tampa says if LeBron wasn't so left, he would have a stronger or more stable market. He then says, even if he just left politics out of the equation, like Michael Jordan does, it would make a big difference. Then I think about OJ Simpson, obviously a ton of controversy around OJ Simpson, but my understanding is that his rookie card is still a very desirable card by a lot of people. So, you know, do we, like people still listen to Michael Jackson music, you know, people, how short is the memory of, of, of the hobby and will comments that a guy like LeBron James makes in 2022 impact the values of his cards much longer than the duration of 2022, in your opinion? The answer is, is it depends on the player's greatness. No one's buying Rod Carruth cards because of what he did and because no one knows who he is. But LeBron's done everything, so he will be forgiven. Everyone forgets about the whole Kobe situation, what happened with him. Right. Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. A lot of people forget about that. I mean, a lot of people don't even know about it. So 
uh, to answer your question, it all depends on your greatness. People will always forget. It's just like all they're going to remember is that 50 minute highlight reel on YouTube. And it's like, wow, that he was great. Because whether you like it or not, this generation growing up, LeBron, Curry, Giannis, these are their guys. And when they grow up, they're going to choose not to remember what political stance. They might not even remember who our president was at that time. Yeah. You know, so it's like, yeah, but I remember when I went to L.A. and he did he got a triple double and, and just and dunked on this dude. Like, that's what they're going to remember. Like, to me, that's what it is. All right. Let's go to a couple of comments that have come in on this topic. This is a little bit of a, a match under some people out in the chat. Tony Sin says, I think the way LeBron goes about his business with super teams also greatly hurts him. You'd be hard up to find someone that doesn't like MJ. LeBron is about 50 50. Yeah, that makes somebody I think there are people that don't like MJ, but that makes sense to me. JH says MJ will always be worth more than LeBron. Easy decision between the two on who to invest in for long term. I mean, I I somewhat agree, but I can't I like I have some LeBron cards. I not many, a couple. And I love these cards and I I feel like they're very strong long-term holds. Now is probably the worst time to sell them in the last 3 years. I feel like they that in time He's going to go down as an all-time great, and comments he made on his Twitter in 2022 are going to be forgotten. Just, just my thoughts. Tampa then says, I hate to say this, but politics affect everyone. The OJ situation only directly affected a few, although although the whole world was watching. So it might have only affected a few, but everyone knows what he did. So I question, I kind of, I hear what you're saying, Tampa, but, you know, I wonder as well. Uh, he goes on to say MJ is the true GOAT, which I, I certainly agree with. And uh, Jay says, LeBron will always support something tough to support. We'll always, I'm not sure what that means. We'll always support CN. Do you know what that means? I'm not no. sure. Okay. But, what, but, you know, LeBron's also built a school for underprivileged kids. Right. And he's done so much from a, a philanthropy perspective. Like, yeah, it's hard not to respect that. Well, he, here's the thing. If, if, if I could ask, I, I mean, he's not, no longer living, but if I could ask my grandfather, who's the GOAT? He'd probably say like a Bill Russell, or he'd probably say um, if it was football, uh, like Broadway Joe or something like that. It's eras of goats. Uh, mm -hmm. Jordan's going to be forever known, but nobody talks about Will and his dominance or or, or um, Kareem. You know, everyone makes these top five lists, and it's all guys that are currently on rosters or just retiring. Like, you're forgetting about these greats. I mean, Pistol Pete, I mean, I don't even think he made a championship, but... He was balling out at LSU, and, and, and there's just a lot of guys that are forgotten. Um, Shaq, I mean, Shaq was not – Shaq was a phenomenon when he came to the league, but he, he was also a big man that just dominated. They had to make a rule, I believe it was for him, for three seconds in the paint because it's just like this guy just won't get out of the way. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know, but in EuroLeague, Boban, the guy that used to play for Dallas, just got traded. He's like a two-time MVP over there because all he used to do is wait in the paint and just reject people. And over here, you can't do that. But like, everyone has their goats, and I'm and, and I'm I'm more than positive saying that as these kids grow up, the 10, 15, 20 year olds right now, LeBron is going to be their guy. Jordan's always there. Also, got to remember Jordan, a different era of cards. If we're talking cards, the 80s were so plain and bassy looking. The 90s inserts came out and blew everyone's minds. And then fast forward to 2003 when Exquisite comes out and Jordan's a part of it with a game used jersey, like. Oh my gosh. Like, so his legacy continues, but if they decided not to put Jordan exquisite, I'd like to know if LeBron gets a little bit ahead of Jordan, because if he wasn't an exquisite. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great thought experiment right there for sure. Uh, thank you, Tampa for clarifying. He was talking about China. Appreciate okay. that. Um, uh, Lou says, great discussion. Some of this comes down to the average age of the hobby and where the money flows. Right. That's exactly right. It comes down to what you just said, Mark, about different eras of goats. And it's, you know, Babe Ruth will always be there. Wayne Gretzky will always be there. Uh, Michael Jordan will always be there. They kind of sit atop all the other goats of the re of the relevant sports. And um, and that's where it's fun because we can pick who we like and who we consider. Be. I, I like to say nowadays we use the term goat just like we use the term grail so loosely. But I like to say goats travel in herds. There can be more than more than <laughs> one of them out there uh, per sport. So um, okay, let's uh, let's go along to something different right now. I want to talk about the volatility we've seen in the hobby in the last couple of years now, really since the 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 pandemic came into our lives. Um, 
how, from your perspective, I mean, you are a boots to the ground kind of guy in our hobby. I feel like you've got some really good in, intel on what's going on out there. How have you seen people adapting to the volatility that we have seen in the last couple of years? Well, at the beginning, let me tell you, it was it was it was basically a rap video. Money falling from the skies at shows. People who never even had a watch are wearing Rolexes. They're getting new Mercedes. Like life was good. Every card goes up. It was just like a printing machine. Um, once things kind of leveled out, and 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 I'm, and I'm talking about base and silvers when they started. Wait a minute. There's twenty thousand Zions, or there's twenty five thousand Lucas. How can they all be going for two thousand bucks? Like that doesn't make sense. Um, and I think also with, um, with with all that, you know, we got information. Card ladder came around. I can almost guarantee you, before card ladder came around, everyone just thought I have the rarest Luca, and it was the base or the silver. Or, but when they started making their um, their population reports uh, very visible or market cap, Chris loves the market caps and talking about what's worth. So you start seeing that, you start putting, oh my gosh, wait a minute, these aren't rare. And then and then it moved on to numbered stuff, number prisms. And then it's like, wait a minute, 199 or 99 is not good enough. Now we got to go to gold. So basically it almost moves in like a pyramid, like a step. Like, okay, we're starting out at the base, we're starting out at the silvers. Now how are we going to move up? Now how are we going to move up? And some people got left behind because they thought holding a thousand Luca base, PSA 10s was the way to go. And they got slaughtered, unfortunately. But the people who took their gains or or at least just what they were working with, their bankroll, and moved up, they, you know, they they got rewarded. But it's been that way for these past two years. You've got to keep moving up and moving up and moving up. And some people say, Well, how can I keep moving up? These cards are going for a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. This is when fractional, this is like real life fractional, when you and a buddy say, Hey, want to split that? Or an auction night comes and like, hey, I like this Giannis. Want to split it? Yeah. And all right, forget about it. Like a lot of people will just group up and it's actually funny because no one signs contract. Uh, listen, I've been in the business for a long time. When you buy a house, paperwork is the stack like this. When we buy cards, it's just, it's not even a handshake. It's like, hey, you want it? Yeah, let's get it. And it's over with. <laughs> and and cards are trading hands at the same values of houses uh, oftentimes. So you're right. I've never, I've never thought that. That when we, you know, you buy anything, any investment, like any registered investment, you buy any, you know, real estate asset, you need a lawyer, you need all sorts of paperwork. In sports cards, you can buy a card for, you know, 150K and whatever. And and like I'm talking about a small house in a remote town exactly. uh, and you don't need any any lawyers or any paperwork. You just, hey, find a way to get me paid and here's your here's your card. Pretty, what? pretty interesting uh, thought right there. Let's talk about liquidity in the hobby because it's becoming, I think, it, well, it's always been important, but you are a guy who buys and sells singles. You're, you're a singles dealer, a professional singles dealer. That's what I'm calling you. How important is liquidity for someone who operates in the hobby as a, as a singles dealer like you do? Liquidity is probably almost more important than the cards that you own because you can go on like this binge, like you can find an auction and say, oh my gosh, it's a steal, it's a deal. And then you find another one and you find another one and all of a sudden you look and you're broke. Now you gotta sell them. Well, it's a lot easier to buy a card than it is to sell a card. So you have to have some type of limits in place um, for some professional people. And I don't say go do this, but if some people have lines of credit, some people use that, pay it back, back and forth. Um, but companies like PWCC, like Golden, where they came, where they made their vaults, they lend. 33, 50%. And if it wasn't for that, I think the hobby would have came to almost a standstill, if not a crawl. Because when you send a card in, and it's it's no auction fault, but from start to finish, from when you send it in to when you get paid, it's about two to three months. You know, if you can get a 50% loan on that at 0%, so it's not costing any points, now you can go out and buy something else off of that. Now, if you choose to take that next card you bought, send it back to saying send it to PWCC. Hey, run it in an August auction. They'll give you 50% on that. So that's one way that uh, I, I, I personally like to do it because they cap you at 50%. So at worst, you're going to just pay them back. But um, liquidity is everything. You have to have money ready. If someone calls and says, I got this card, but I got to sell it today. You got to get in the card and we'll get it. Like that, that's, that's it. You buy that deal. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. The one thing I will say is the difference between like PayPal, cash, and, and, and all that stuff. That's tough. Some people right now who have held cards for 10, 15 years and their cards appreciated to a hundred thousand. Like I want a hundred thousand dollars cash. Sure. Let me go walk to the bank and pull out this fat stack like this, the hundreds and nothing's going to happen. Like it's just, some people just don't think, but you know, you're talking 10, 15, 20,000. Yeah. But you got to like, you got to, you got to understand. Yeah. Cash is, cash is becoming King again. I've, I saw Patrick Bet David put out a tweet. I think it was earlier today, basically saying we're in a, we're we're back to cash being king, uh, just with the way the economy is right now. I suppose so. A couple of comments here. I like Tampa right here. It says I've been on on I've been on the binge buying for years now. Ha ha. Yeah. Hey. Same here. Same here. Tampa. Uh, cool. Glad to know what. Glad. What's that? What's that, Mark? Oh, dollar cost averaging. Exactly, exa- exactly right. The, the problem is if it's always going down, your your dollar cost averaging is one thing. It, it's uh yeah, your dollar it's just a, a slow a slow decline. Uh Temple says PWCC is lending at zero percent. You did just say but lending who's lending at zero percent? Let me backtrack. Not lending. They give you an advance against your cards that you put into an auction. Not lending. Fair. Yeah. And let's uh quick hello to you, David Lampley. Uh thanks for joining the show. Um, okay, we're going to start to wrap up. We've been going for over 50 minutes. This has been a blast, by the way, Mark. We have very good viewership tonight, uh, so thanks for joining. If you're watching, if you're not yet following Mark on Instagram, at Boston Authentic, and if you're so inclined to follow myself on social media, there it is on Instagram, at Lee underscore sports cards live. There's my Twitter, and you can join the Facebook group as well if you would like to. Uh, oh, thank you, Justin. Vic, appreciate that very much. Yeah, this is fun, Mark. You're a great guest. Um, where does the hobby go from here? That's a pretty open-ended question, but you know, we've seen all this, we've seen all, all this volatility, these, these drastic cycles, these peaks way up here, these valleys way down here, these middle finger graphs as they've become to be called. We have the national coming up in two weeks, basically, uh, just over two weeks. Where, where do you see the hobby going in the, like for the rest of the year, let's say? So the way I'm going to put it first is this. When you don't have to go to work, you have a lot of time to get stuck in the rabbit hole of YouTube. You just start watching videos and videos. And months ago, I started getting into like the sneaker flippers and the watch flippers, like the like the Rolexes and the cards. And now the, the videos that are coming out, it's the same exact videos for uh, across the board for all secondary luxury items. Just fill it in. The watch market is down. The, the sneakers are down. The cards are down. So the good news to me is it's not a card problem. It's not a hobby problem. It's it's an it's an economical problem. That's just what it is. So I don't think cards are going anywhere. This asset class has been around since, you know, the early 1900s, possibly before the tobacco cards. Maybe even before, I don't know. But it's the hobby's not going anywhere. Now, if the question was what's going to happen to my card I bought 6 months ago at the all-time highs, well, that I'd be a little scared about. Like Sometimes you just got to cut bait, take some fresh cash and go find a deal. Because like you said before, Jeremy, cash is king. So when you're at a show and someone's like, well, I want comps. Well, I got cash and you want it. What are you willing to do? Now, some people get a little crazy and say 50% or something like that. No, that's ridiculous. But if you say, you know, 85, 90, you know, you, you kind of put a little bit of insurance in there for yourself for maybe a further decline to kind of protect yourself. But to me, I don't think the hobby's going anywhere. It's just resetting right now. It has, it can't go up 100%. It can't just be to the moon, to the rocket ship. Like it can't, it, it, it can't be that. The stock market doesn't even do that. And that thing's been around forever too. Yeah. It's just, just can't be greedy. And like, if you're in it for to PC, enjoy your PC. But if you're in it to invest, um, you just got to watch the numbers daily and you have to learn how to take a loss. If anyone ever comes to you and says, I'm a full-time dealer, I've never lost BS right off the, right off the rip BS. Yeah. And I, you know, the one point you just made uh, in there that I really liked was, you know, if you have, if you have, if you're sitting on cards that have come down in value and you don't, you don't think that they are going to recover the, and it's tough from a psychological perspective to lock in a loss by selling a card that you bought for 4000 for 2000 or for 2500 That's tough to do, but you have to do it because you have to figure, well, if you think that you could do better things with that $2,500 in the future than keeping it in that particular card or asset, 
-hmm. you're better served to sell it, take that $2,500 and redeploy it into something that you can do better at. You told me a story before that you, you were into a card for 4K, you sold it for 2,600. That's where I got those numbers from, by the way, for my example. And, you know, it's, it's hard to lock in that loss, but you have to do it. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? I mean, the way, uh, there was a question way early in the show, how do you operate your business sales targets and things like that? I get excited when I make money because now I know I can move a, a dog or a loser and kind of counteract that win. I know it sounds ridiculous, but if you know you have a, a box of dogs or, you know, a loser cards, you know, sell something for a $5,000 profit and then sell the loser card for, for whatever market value is, or maybe take 5% off. And you didn't really lose anything because if you add, if you, you know, you put it with that winner, it kind of all works out. I was, when I was in the car business, the owner used to always tell me, it's not what you made this week. It's not what you made this month. It's what's at the end of the year because it comes in droves. Like right now, we all know the summer's terrible. Everyone's vacationing all that stuff. But what if September we have this monstrous thing or, or, or October or something big happens in football and just Patrick Mahomes cards are through the roof? No one's going to remember this. Again, like the when we were talking about the LeBron thing, we have such a short memory. We, you know, we have such a short memory, so people will get over it. But right now, it's just like take your wins, take your losses, sit on some cash, and look for a true deal. You don't have to buy everything. Look for a true deal. Redeploy, redeploy. Redeploy. All right, let's go to some comments. Uh, Staven says, "Happy I caught your stream even towards the end. Cash has always been king in the hobby." Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, there's Louie says consumer confidence will return capital flows to where it's treated best. Mark is the goat. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lou. And, and that again, Lou and it says realizing losses equals lowering your tax bill. There's mm -hmm. strategy to doing that at the end of the year, kind of assessing things, but you can't wait till December 28th because you need to make that transaction happen. You might want to start looking at that early November uh, or whenever it makes sense for you. So, Okay, um, we're gonna we're gonna start. We're, we are gonna wrap this up. Uh, we're we're almost at fifty eight minutes here. We are doing collectible live. I asked this question to all the guests. What are your thoughts on fractional investing as it fits into the overall hobby landscape? I like it a lot because, like I said earlier, guys are splitting cards. That's that's a form of fractional. But when it comes to like a collectible, I like it a lot. I I think I I think we just gotta you know get a lot more uh, people involved, which would be amazing, a lot more users, a lot more buyers um, to make it more liquid. But I think it's great for the hobby. Um, I personally own two assets over there. I'm part of the LeBron RPA out of 99 because I know I'm never going to shell up $2 million <laughs> to buy one for myself. And um, I also involved in a Mahomes 8.5 RPA. Um, it's just like, hey, I'm a part of it. If it sells, great. If it doesn't, hey, I'm kind of an owner. But it's cool because I mean we we all we we all talk about these grails these hundred thousand dollar cards we forget about one percent of us can afford those the rest of the people like you know I, I you get X amount from your check per week and you know what do you want to do with it do you want to go get some extra burgers or do you want to buy a rip a pack of cards or buy some cards or something like that like if fractional is great uh, it's great for the hobby it's just we got to get it working so it's great. Yeah, and I think it'll. I think like anything, it takes some time to build up that secondary market liquidity. I think because of that, there are lots of opportunities. I follow a podcast and an Instagram account called uh, Six One Five Collector. Uh, his mm -hmm. name's Doug Turner and his son Brandon, and they do a great job. Shout out to them. But uh, they're always analyzing and putting out where where is there a an arbitrage opportunity on collectible where the the asset is trading at a lower value than the most recent comps. And yep. uh, it's um, it's unbelievable, actually, some of the opportunities that they've identified. So I'd recommend people check out their podcast, listen to what, what they're saying. But I like what you said. You know, I'm not going to shell out two million for a LeBron rookie, but I can take two, three, four, five hundred bucks and throw it at that card, and I own a piece of it. That's pretty cool. And of course, your risk is much lower than if you did shell out two million on that card, and now all of a sudden it's worth a million. I've seen that card go all over the place, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Will we see you at the National in a few weeks here, Mark? Yes, I will be set up with a bunch of a uh, bunch of buddies of mine. Awesome. Well, I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, we met at the National last year. We met at the Mint Collective. Yep. Uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing you again now that we've done this show and uh, spent a bit of time together. So, Mark, thanks so much for joining. Uh, everybody watching, thank you for joining. If you're not yet following Mark on Instagram, there it is on the ticker right now, at Boston Authentic. You can tell this guy's got a lot of experience 
follow him and uh, and enjoy it. Mark, thank you. Uh, final comments, any shout outs you'd like to make? Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to four Instagram accounts. Please give them a follow for, you know, if you enjoy my stuff, you'll enjoy their, enjoy their stuff. Two Step Cards, my buddy Chris, he actually wrote in on here. Him and his wife, they do an amazing, uh, amazing job. Coleman underscore Coleman underscore cards, great wealth of knowledge for '90s cards, things like that. Uh, sports card EX, none other than Lou Papa, great, great hobby guy. And last but not least, my buddy, my road warrior, war chiefs, that uh, Ryan. Please give them all a follow. Awesome, thank you so much, Mark, for joining everybody in the chat. Thank you guys so much for joining next Sunday on Collectible Live. Our guest will be Brom Walker from Sotheby's. Excited to have him on and hear what he's got to talk about. So that'll be next Sunday at 7 o'clock Eastern. And then there will be no show for two weeks as I will be in New York and then the Atlantic City and then back for a show on the uh, the first weekend in August. Mark, thanks again for joining everyone else in the chat. Have a great week ahead. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.